slide here, there's a few things that I want to cover in today's class. Today's class is kind of tying up a whole lot of sense on topics that are in the textbook, spread over all the chapters, and I've chosen to omit them previously, and you'll see why now. I'm going to start bringing them all together, integrating them in a way that will put it together so that we can understand a very important concept in process control. And the concept of today's class is stability. Okay, so stability is, is an important concept to understand. As a control engineer, you can take a perfectly stable process and by applying a feedback controller that's not stable, you can go destabilize the system. We don't like to destabilize things. Destabilizing things leads to bad outcomes, such as injuring people, damaging the equipment, and worse. Okay? So stability is an important concept to understand before we go apply a control. But let's step right back, almost back to about and we said there the transfer function gives us some output y when supplied with an input x. So we've got this transfer function, we've called it so far g of s, and one way we can look at that is simply consider any output divided by any input s. So we mostly use the transfer function that says when I know what the input is in the Laplace domain, it can find me the corresponding output in the Laplace domain. And then we use that output to visualize it in simulate or as you're quite comfortable doing as well being able to visualize it in time domain. So just to emphasize that, that those y's and x's are in fact And we always assume, assume we start at steady state. So if we use the transfer functions, we've got that implicit assumption there that we start at steady state. Let's think really carefully what steady state means. In this context, steady state implies that y by t <coughs> is equal to zero. And that, that's really what steady state means. We're starting at a point in time where nothing is changing. And that's exactly what the derivative tells us. It's changed. Okay, so if nothing is changing, those derivatives are zero. That's what steady state means. Today I'm going to come right back to chapter 3. And there was a one input that we never really considered. There's a very special input called an impulse. So the impulse input is essentially a spike. You get a point in the time domain, an impulse input says, you're at state state, and then you put in a spike into my process, and come right back down and <coughs> So this impulse is a spike. Now it's not a realistic input, which is why I've chosen not to cover it until now. It's not a very realistic input. Right? It's not practical to put in this spike, but in fact you cannot really do this. The best you can do is to put in a step up and a step down. Very quickly, step up, step down. And in fact, the Laplace transport for the spike so here's my spike, the Laplace transform of this spike, I'm just going to put it there loosely like that, is equal to 1. It's got a very interesting Laplace transform, equal to 1. And in fact, the derivation for this Laplace transform says, if I step up and I step down after some time of delta t, Take the Laplace transform that step up, step down. You, you're able to do that, actually. Remember, we did that a few weeks ago. But then the Laplace transform says, let delta t tend to zero. 
and then see what happens to that class transform well, that class transform tends to work. The map is all interesting. If you like that sort of thing, go look it up in the textbook. But we're just going to simply use this result that if we supply such an input to my process, that input of S over there that I'm talking about is 1. Well, if I'm putting that input into my process, what is output? <coughs> the output of S then is simply the transfer function. So that's really cool. From a purely conceptual mathematical point of view, should I be able to put an input like this into my process, my output that I'll see in the time domain or in the time domain is in fact the process of the function itself. So that's the only reason why we might want to use this input in practice, is so that we can observe exactly what my process looks like. Okay, so I'm going to put that, those thoughts up there, and I'm going to use them in a couple of minutes from now. The next point I'd like to take a look at is another topic, another concept, function order. The running function order refers to the complexity of the derivatives. So let's uh, perhaps just put this note up there. Order is the highest derivative of the output variable. that output y is the output of that output variable in the ODE system. That's all very theoretical and such. Let's take a look at a practical example of that. If I had a tank and I was feeding the tank with a certain concentration input, CA0, this tank has volume V1, so we're all seen this in reactor design several times, feed it with a concentration CA0 at a flow rate of F, goes into that tank for volume 1, that concentration leaving then we call CA0. So there's some sort of reaction occurring in there. This, the reactant A leaves at some concentration CA1. And we proceed to put that into another tank. This tank now has volume V2. It continues to react in that second unit. <coughs> and it then leaves with concentration C8. Okay, and let's, uh, if we do some of the, the work, let's assume that we can calculate the transfer function for each one of these reactors. So I can get a transfer function for this unit, and I can get a transfer function for the second unit. And let's assume that there might be, for example, that CA1 over CA0 is equal to 1 over tau 1 s plus 1, where tau 1 is the volume of the first tank over n. So for very simple reactions, that might be a valid transfer function for relating the intermediate concentration CA1 to the inner concentration CA0. Similarly, you can derive a transfer function for the second reaction, CA2, over CA1, and that's equal to 1 over tau 2 S plus 1, where tau 2 is the volume in the second tank divided by the flow rate. And if you did today's assignment, you can see where this is going. You did this, in fact, in simulator. We can then take the product of those transfer functions We've seen this as well before in the course. And then the product of those transfer functions can get you the outlet concentration CA2 as a function of the input CA0. So should I want to know the very last concentration CA2 when I change the first concentration CA0, that's simply the product of those two transfer functions. Tau 1 S plus 1 and tau 2 S plus 1. So we call this a second order system.
I'm just mentioning that to you to emphasize this point, you're comfortable with the terminology. But what that means is, should I go and take this transfer function back to the time domain? So in other words, if I can take the inverse of pass transform of this, what you'll get then is an ODE with terms involving D2CA2 by DT and DCA2 by DT. So in other words, should you go back to the time domain, you'll be getting a second order derivative. So the second derivative of A is 2 with respect to time. And that's what the word order comes from. Order comes from this highest derivative of the output in the ODE system. So that's a practical example. Here's the theoretical definition of it. But in practice, what it means is should you have derived that original ODE system for this two tanks, you would have, it would have required a second order derivative. So I just wanted to emphasize that point. As I said at the start of the class, today's class, really collects a whole lot of loose ends that really weren't appropriate to introduce earlier on in the course. They would have mean, meant nothing to you a few weeks ago. Now they should mean a whole lot more to you. And these terms are important because you'll see them in your career as, as engineers. So just coming back and filling in the few So now that we've how does this fit in with stability? Remember I said today's class is all about stability. Well, let's take a look at why I've, I've introduced these topics now. So stability has a very, very special definition, very specific definition that we should have in mind. So we say a system, and that usually means a transfer function, a system is stable if when provided with a stable input, <coughs> so in other words we put a stable input into the system, the output is stable. Okay, well let's take a look at what we mean by that. We take our system, there's some arbitrary transfer function, g of x. This could be pretty, pretty simplistic, or it could be pretty complex. Any transfer function. If I put a stable input in, well, what is a stable input? A stable input, for example, would be a step. That's a stable input. I put a step in. That's a stable input. A step in. An example of an unstable input is something like this. A ramp. A ramp is unstable. Keep going long enough and it just gets unbounded. So sometimes definitions for stability will replace this idea of a stable input. They'll say simply put in a bounded input. So some input that's defined and stays defined, and the output is remains bounded. You sometimes see that definition for stability. The system is stable when provided with a bounded input the output remains bounded. It's an alternative way of saying it. So G of S then, in other words, this output, we're concerned here about whether that's going to blow up or if it's going to stay stable. How many of you have created an unstable output in simulator? Yeah, you should have all done it for assignment four. Right? As that time delay went larger and larger, you created and blew up your plant. 
Okay, we don't want to do that in practice. So our goal of today's class is can we tell we're going to blow up our system without actually trying it? We want to be able to predict whether our system is stable. This is why it's an important concept. Well, how do we check, check that? So this comes back down to some important theory that I glossed over earlier. So in my teaching, I believe in just-in-time learning. Learn concepts just before you need them. There's no point in me teaching you this two, three weeks ago, and then you don't remember it. So let's come back to a topic that I, I skipped in chapter four of the textbook, and that is holes. We're going to talk about holes quickly, and then we're going to come back to stability. Well, what's a pole? A pole is a root of a transfer function in the denominator. So if we go back to my transfer function, uh, g of s, g of s is my transfer function. I can express that as a numerator portion and a denominator portion. Sometimes in simulac you'll actually see numerator So a pole is the roots of d of s are called poles. It's just an electrical engineering term that they like to use. You might also see the terminology zeros. Zeros are the, numera are the numerators roots. We'll just focus on poles right now. Poles and zeros. So let's take an example of a system where I might have written my output y over my input. So this is my transfer function. Let's just take a very simple numerator. We don't want to uh, focus on that. Our goal is to understand the poles, the denominator. And let's take all the, all the possible <coughs> examples you'll ever be able to see. You'll see maybe a, a single s in the denominator, tau 1 s plus 1, and then tau 2 s squared plus 2 times tau 2 xi s plus 1. We come back right back to where we looked just after the first midterm we were looking at second order systems. So there's one over there. <laughs> and if you did partial fraction expansion, you could write this as k1 over s plus some other constant k2 divided by tau1 s plus 1 plus some other third constant k3 over tau 2 s squared, sorry, this is tau 2 squared s squared, my, my mistake, tau, squared, tau 2 squared s squared plus 2 times tau 2 s, tau 2 xi s plus 1. So you can always expand that into the constituent three terms. And my goal is to act, look at all three of them. So going back to your class table, that first term there represents a constant. This second term <coughs> represents the first order system. And this one is the second order. In fact, sometimes we call this a zeroth order. Before we move on, what is the order of this transfer function g of s? g of s is first order, second order, third order, fourth order. Fourth order. 
Okay, the G of S here is a full form. Okay, so let's take a look at, at this. And I'm going to start actually by considering that first order term. have four roots. Our roots are first one is S1 is zero. Okay. There's my first root right up here at the front. S1 is equal to zero. My second root <coughs> S2 is minus one over tau. And then my third and fourth root, they come in pairs. So S3 is equal to minus psi over tau 2 plus J times 1 minus psi squared over tau 2. So this formula here is not, not anything new. It's, it's In fact, we looked at that several weeks ago. S4's root is the conjugate of that. So minus psi over tau 2 minus j, the complex number, 1 minus psi squared. So there's my four roots. tells us whether the system is overdamped or underdamped, so maybe just write a note here that psi greater than 1 is overdamped or underdamped. This is something you need to study for. Tomorrow it's overdamped. <coughs> Let's start with the easiest one. The first root, S1 equals 0, 
that root has zero imaginary components and zero real components. So there's my S1. Where's S2? First quadrant, second quadrant, third, fourth quadrant. <coughs> There's no imaginary component, S2 is equal to minus 1 over tau. Okay, and then S3 and 4 might be out here, for example. There'll be a mirror image on that horizontal axis. So this might be S3, and that might be S4. Notice all my roots here are, are at those locations. Let's take a look at what those locations mean and what happens if we start moving around in that plane. This plane, this real imaginary plane, is critical to understanding stability. This plane tells us where our roots lie. Remember, our roots are our poles, and our poles tell us what stability is all about. This is why that diagram really is the essential diagram for understanding stability. So let me perhaps go back to that second term we had over there. So recall our second term, I'll just start, start with that. And our second term was K2 divided by tau 1 S plus 1. We're so comfortable with this one, we don't need to think about it. We know that this is an exponential. There's a declining exponential here. And in fact, consider this as an output of S divided by an input of S. What if, what if my input was this impulse? What if my input was an impulse? In other words, my input of S is equal to 1. Okay. Then my output S is actually just simply that transfer function K2 over tau 1 S plus 1. So my goal is to quickly understand what that transfer function is. If you look at that transfer function and invert it back to the time domain, go back to that handout, you'll see on that handout that the time domain, if you plot time on my horizontal axis, the time domain transfer function for this is output in the time domain is equal to k2 over tau 1 e to the minus t of the tau 1. What does that look like? Well, it simply looks like this. It says at time 0, I will spike up and then decline in an exponential way. So at time 0, t equals 0, that exponential is 0 e to the 0 is 1, so the spike has height equal to k2 over tau 1. That's the peak of that spike, and then it declines, declines over time. So this is my, my question here. Tau 1, focusing on this guy down here, tau 1, what happens to tau 1? when it becomes bigger or smaller. What happens if tau 1 is small? But this is my base case here in green. What happens if I use a smaller tau 1? Am I going to decline faster or am I going to decline slower? 
What did we learn about tau, the time constant, a few classes ago? How many time constants does it take to see a full change in a system? So if you've got a really long time constant, it's going to take a long time to see the change. If you've got a short time constant, things happen really quickly. So a short time constant does that. A long time constant does that. happen in this plane as tau 1 gets, <coughs> gets small. So if tau 1 gets small, where does that root move? To the left or the right? Okay, so this is tau 1 gets small. And if tau 1 gets large, Tau gets larger and larger, we move closer and closer to zero. <coughs> Let's quickly prove that to ourselves. So there's my impulse input. I'll post this simulation, uh, simulation on the website. There's my impulse input, short time constant, medium, large time constant. <coughs> So S tau is plus 1, there's my decline, I pulse at time 10, is my pulse input, and by about 5 seconds I'm back to steady state again, back to 0. Let's take a time constant of 10 minutes, I pulse in at the same point in time, it takes me about 50 time minutes to drop back down. A really long time constant of a, of a thousand, you pulse that in, very <coughs> decrease, right? So what do you notice about that, that plot? What does it look like? It almost looks like a step, right? So as tau 1 gets larger and larger, this point moves closer to the origin and approaches this root here, and that root, remember, is S1 equals 0. So longer and longer time constants start to look almost like a step. And in fact, right at the origin, that is simply a step. So that's, uh, that helps us understand what goes along this horizontal line. My next question is, what happens if I go further? How could you go further? How could you go further? You have negative. Okay, so let's take the transfer function of the form. Okay, so let's go back here to this. If tau is negative, we're going to get a root that's on the right-hand side. So if you look at that, if tau is negative, what happens down here? So for those of you that can't see it at the back, e to the minus t over tau 1. If tau 1 is negative, what happens to that exponential? It's positive. What happens is time gets both increases. the plus, then it's more positive, more positive as time progresses, <coughs> keeps, what do we say, it's scrolling, bounded or unbounded? Unbounded. It's unbounded, right? So you can now pretty much start to see that anything that's this side of the, of the plus will grow unbounded. And this is the region you never want to be there. Okay? You will be unstable in that area. 
So this is unstable. say is roots that are positive will lead to unstable behavior and we actually have a very special name for those roots we call them right half plane poles so RHP right half plane poles ask how might I get those? Right? In practice, most engineering systems we create are by themselves stable. That's just a phenomenon you can show to yourself. Take a model of a distillation column, take a model of a heat exchanger, you put a finite input into that system, you get a finite output again. So you might ask, well how can I get something to be unstable? So things become unstable if we put them into feedback control and we don't use the right settings in the feedback controller, then we can go take a stable system that's perfectly fine and make it unstable. So to understand how that works is we need to look at the closed loop transfer function. Let's just quickly recap this closed loop transfer function. And it's fine. Also, would we have enough things like in series? Would that cause the transfer? Enough stable things in series are, also, are still stable. So the product of stable systems is still stable. Given the restrictions that we have for the groups, how would you ever get a negative power? I mean, that's what I'm going to show now. Oh. Yeah. So to do that, you need to understand the closed loop transfer function. And you can do this now in your sleep. I've seen this too many times. The closed loop transfer function we're going to look at from the set point. So there's my GC by controller, there's my GP by process, and there's my output CD. And just to make this interesting, let's put a block over here which call this GM. That's my transfer function for the measurement, which because we've all done assignment five and in the tutorial, we understand what GM is doing. Okay. So we're taking this closed loop transfer function, and by a closed loop transfer function, I mean the transfer function that wraps all of this up into <coughs> In other words, we're going to create one transfer function that tells me what my output is when I change the input. Remember that was the definition of transfer function at the start of this class today. If my output is CV and my input is SP, I can get one transfer function for the entire system. So CV, S over SP. And that transfer function, you can, you can show to yourself, and you should, is GC of S times GP of S divided by 1 plus GC of S G 
GP of S times GM of S. Now, I don't, I'm not a big fan of teaching people tricks and shortcuts, but there is a shortcut here that most of you have figured out in the tutorial yourself. Is that this denominator always has this special form. One plus something. Right? You've all kind of noticed this or picked up on it in the tutorial, that that denominator when you form this closed loop transfer function has this one plus structure. So here's a, a neat little shortcut for you to be aware of. That what is that GOL represent? Well GOL represents the product of the transfer functions. Take a look carefully where I'm starting. Start just after this comparator. Just after you do the subtraction. So start here and work your way through the flow, coming back, and stop just before the comparison. So you start there and you end there, and the product of any transfer function you encounter along that route is GOL. So in this case, it's GC times GP times GA. So that's a neat little shortcut. Prefer you not to use it, but <coughs> I prefer you to actually simply derive what CV is when you change SP, but you'll always find it comes out and has that structure. And because it, it appears so commonly, we call that 1 plus GOL, we call that my characteristic equation. Why do we call it that characteristic equation? Well, remember what we said about the denominator. What does the denominator tell me? <coughs> if I'm staying, 1 plus GOL is the guy that's going to tell you whether your system is stable. Okay? So this is going to tell me, this tells me if I am stable. That's why we use this. So let me end off with an example that will help you understand a concept we've seen earlier, but you may not really have understood why it was true. <coughs> this characteristic equation will emphasize quite nicely why we always need the sign of our feedback controller Kc to match the sign of our process Kp. KC and KP must always have the same sign. Why is that? Where does that rule come from? Well, the characteristic equation will show us. Let's take a look at one of the most simple systems. So consider, as an example, that GP of S is simply a first order transfer function. So KP over tau S plus 1. So the most basic first order process, consider GM to be simply one. So just a, it's, there is no measurement dynamics. Simply pass right through that transfer function. And consider the most simple controller, GC of S, equal to just a proportional only controller.
plus GC is equal to KC, GP is equal to KP over tau x plus 1, and GM is equal to 1. Okay, so that's my characteristic equation. Probably the most important rule to make sure your system is safe. 